Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back. I hope you had very productive workshop sessions, and I'm glad you're joining us for the final panel of the day. So if you were here this morning, one of our guests pointed out that our first panel was quite focused on conflicts rather than their resolutions. And this panel will shift that focus. In a multipolar world, new actors are emerging in the international conflict resolution space. And we'd like to explore what that means in this upcoming panel. Guiding you through it will be your moderator and senior conflict resolution advisor at the Austrian Center for Peace, Anna Hess. Thank you, Damita. Thank you, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me well? I hear myself. OK. Um, right. Welcome to this panel. I know it has been uh, three almost long days. And it's the end of a very busy day for some of us who come from workshops. So I am grateful to you for being here and for your interest uh, in what we have called, in a panel, what we have called uh, emerging actors in mediation. And uh, before I go into the context and introduce you um, to the amazing panelists that I have here, I want to make a disclaimer on the um, languaging. Uh, Meredith and I had this conversation, but also with some of you, we're not really talking about some of the actors that we're going to talk about. They're not emerging, they're not new, they have been there for a long time, and um, they have been doing mediation as well in a different way. So, but for the sake of um, you know, the fluidity and going with the flow, where we might be using emerging actors as we go along. Actually, in our workshop, we agreed to use global partners. I don't know if Tanya is here from Ukraine, but uh, that's what they're called in Ukraine mm -hmm. now, global partners. But the idea is, um, in a context, this morning, as Damita said, you were talking about the a security context and the shifting context, right? We were talking about the geopolitical tensions being on the increase um, and how that impacts the peace and security architecture in Europe, but beyond Europe. Uh, and that what that means as a context when it comes to the resolution of the conflict. So we have the geopolitical context changing massively. We have cracks, or um, I don't want to say collapse completely, but the paralysis of the multilateral world order. Um, here again, a disclaimer, I would say Euro-Atlantic multilateral order rather than world order, because we see the collapse in the Euro-Atlantic peace and security architecture and the multilateral institutions. Uh, we see hybrid wars, we see prolonged wars, we see fragmentation of conflict, and we see multiplicity of actors. And what does that mean as a context? How does that, how does that influence the space within which conflicts are to be settled, if they are to be settled. In our workshop, we actually raised the question as well, are all conflicts mediatable? Because as mediators, we have this urge to actually go into mediation. We have the helper syndrome, if I can speak on behalf of the whole community, but there's violence, you want to stop the violence. Now, how it has been done in the past 30 years, when I say we, I'm going to be speaking from the European mediation school, if there is such a thing, right? Uh, the way we have been doing mediation in the past 30 years, more or less, very professionalized, embedded in liberal peace paradigm, what we call, right? And the idea is, before I lose you in the, in the um, <coughs> sorry, technicalities of the concept, the idea of liberal peacemaking was you would bring end to conflict by transforming societies, and that's based in democratization idea, right? So uh, that has been at the, at the core of the liberal peacemaking, at least the attempts from the European and, and um, I should say, Euro-Atlantic uh, perspective. Um, with the rise of the wars, with, with the geopolitical tensions impacting these wars, we see that this approach has had major limitations. And now it's, it, we have either failed, obviously if there is a major war escalating, then we have done something not the way, yeah. I would say wrong, right? We have failed or we have been inefficient, or as we said, Meredith, we have been, now we're also unwelcomed in many cases mm -hmm. with this whole transformative approach to peacemaking. And there has been a lot of conversation, I don't know how in other workshops, but about double standards. So a lot of challenge, not only to the transformative peacemaking, liberal peacemaking, but also the liberal world order or liberal European order, right? There has been a lot of challenge, a lot of resentment, and, and the idea has been that it is not working, it has failed. Now, on this con in this context, we have 
emergence of new, new actors in mediation or other actors in mediation. So the idea is for us to look at, first we will start by looking at um, what we have done. Is this the end of the liberal peace? Mm -hmm. is, it, is it really like we have failed? Of course we have failed with all the good intentions. Where, we ha where have we failed? And, and is there space for reviving liberal peacemaking? Um, are we already talking about, like, in the face of new actors in mediation or emerging actors in mediation who are going, who are doing mediation differently? First, we want to understand how they're doing what they're doing. And then are we talking already about what we call transactional peacemaking? And uh, this morning we talked about it as well. Um, are we, can we already talk about transformative versus transactional peacemaking, or this is too early? And by transactional, what I mean is, you do not impose value system or political transformation in a society when you do mediation, but you help the parties strike a deal on an XYZ issue. It can be economic, it can be humanitarian, right? So, but I have spoken enough. So all of these questions uh, I'm going to pose to my amazing panelists, who I really have the pleasure uh, to, to moderate this discussion. And I'm going to introduce them uh, before we dive into the answers uh, to some of these questions, if not to all of them. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to have to drag my, <laughs> sorry. So to my, um, what is this? This is my left. left. <laughs> uh, <laughs> to my left, I have the pleasure to introduce you to Meredith uh, Preston Mackey. Meredith is the Secretary General of, for the Global Center for Pluralism, uh, with an amazing and extensive experience in mediation. Uh, she has mediated and advised a range of peace processes across Africa as the Regional Director for Africa program with the Center for Humanitarian Dialogue. Most of you might know about humanitarian dialogue. It's a mediation. Uh, we don't have to talk about HD. Uh, she has experience with the UN, has, adv has had advisory role to Kofi Annan during the Kenya National Dialogue and Reconciliation Process in 2007. Throughout more than two 20 years in Africa, Meredith helped establish peace processes in Nigeria and Somalia and facilitated and supported mediation processes in Sudan and South Sudan, among other contexts. Her work thematically uh, spans a range of issues, including electoral conflicts, uh, disarmament, demobilization, and inclusion in peace processes. Meredith continues to contribute to policy discussions on peacemaking globally, um, including teaching peace process design, where she's coming from, actually. She was in Zurich at ETH, and I'm really happy to say that this worked out very well for us. And she began her career working with the Naga in Northeast India, and ethnic minorities in Myanmar. Uh, Meredith, uh, most welcome. It's Thank a great you. pleasure. Good Next to Meredith, we have Dr. Hassan El Khalut. El Khalut. I have to pick Arabic. Um, is the director of Center for Conflict and Humanitarian Studies and associate professor at uh, in conflict management and humanitarian action at the Doha Institute for Graduate Studies. Uh, he has over two decades of experience in post-war recovery, humanitarian response, having worked with international organizations, a number of them. Um, his research spans a wide range of topics related to conflict management, humanitarian action, post-war recovery. Dr. El Haklut <laughs> holds a PhD in post-war reconstruction and development studies from the University of York. Most welcome. Next to Hassan. And then next to Dr. Hassan, we have Khalud Khaish. Did I pronounce it correctly? Uh, Khalud is the founder and director of Confluence Advisory, a think tank formerly based in Khartoum uh, that works on um, three priority policy areas, peace and security, economy, and governance. Khalud also hosted and co-produced Spotlight 249, Sudan's first English language political discussion and debate show. Uh, aimed at young Sudanese. Um, Holud is bringing with her a career spanning the fields of research, aid programming and policy in Sudan and across the Horn of Africa. She has written uh, extensively uh, analytical pieces for several international publications and has provided analysis for research policy institutions worldwide. Holud has um, uh, degrees in conflict and development from SOAS, University of London, and University of Oxford, um, Master of Science in African Studies. Extensive experience. Thank you, Holud, for being here. Most welcome. And last but not least, we have with us Rair Balian. Um, you call yourself a peace-building practitioner uh, with 
extensive experience in uh, leadership positions in the UN, OSCE, and a number of NGOs, among them International Crisis Group and Carter Center. Um, since 1990, Harayat has worked uh, extensively on conflict transformation, elections, and human rights in the Balkans, Eastern Europe, Caucasus, Central Asia, Middle East, pretty much the whole world, Africa. Uh, he has taught graduate courses in conflict resolution, negotiations, mediation, and he's currently teaching at Emory University, um, and with a current focus, he's writing a book on South Caucasus, namely on the failure of mediation in the armenia azerbaijani context when it comes to the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. Um, with that, I'm most welcome, right? Um, I'm going to move on to the gist of our conversation, and which is what we said. Uh, Meredith, is it the end of liberal peace? <laughs> <laughs> where did we go wrong? Well, I think where we went wrong is part of what we want to talk about. But I, the first thing I would say is I don't think it's the end of, every, of anything. Um, Francis Fukuyama, I think, made a strategic error when he said it was the end of anything. And so I don't think any of us should say this is the end of liberal peace. But I think it is definitely um, a huge evolution. And so while we recognize the reality, and the reality is absolutely troubling, and it's troubling towards peacemaking, I think one of the things that's really important for us as peacemakers is to really um, dig into some of the assumptions behind the fragmentation and where we've gone wrong and, and so forth. And so I have to say, your set of questions were phenomenal, but I think it's also hard to imagine how we're going to do justice to all of them in this panel. So I did want to sort of pick up on a couple of threads to start. I've been thinking a lot about several conversations I've been in in the last year. Everybody is talking about double standards. Everyone is talking about hypocrisy. Everyone is talking about the collapse and fragmentation of the, of the global order, of the rules-based international order, as Canadians obsessively call it. Um, one of the things I've been reflecting on within that is that there's a lot of this fairly frantic talk about it. Um, when I was uh, working for Kofi Annan, we were in the midst of, of, a, of a crisis point in the Kenya talks, and there was a whole bunch of us, and we were racing around the, the room trying to get things in order, and the Annan's chief of staff, Shah Hanwana, sort of looked at all of us, and he said, there's a lot of movement, but none of you seem to actually be doing anything. And it's always stayed with me that I think we are obsessive helpers, but sometimes we have to think a little bit about what are we really doing and how are we really taking this forward in a way that is strategic. And so I would say um, that when we look at this fragmentation, there has been a huge defensiveness, and in being defensive about, but the multilateral system needs saving, that we alienate those who maybe have recognized much earlier than us that it was predicated on such deep inequality and that it wasn't a multilateral system for everyone. So I think from a Western perspective, it's really incumbent on us to look that problem really squarely in the face, to be a bit more humble about that, and to engage, therefore, or in a different set of conversations that isn't about how do we defend liberal peace, how do we bring our values back to the table, but how do we, as you mentioned, reflect on where we went wrong and try to engage and learn from others who are maybe doing things differently, but to find a way of starting that not with, I believe this, I assume you believe something else, and therefore that's the starting point of our conversation, but rather to engage with understanding. So to your question about the transactional versus transformative. Peacemaking, I did just want to spend a moment on that. I've just come, as you mentioned, from the peace mediation course, which actually is in Stad, which feels incredibly elitist, but there you go. Um, so I've just come from the mountains of Switzerland, where um, the Swiss government teaches a, a, a terrific two-week course on peace mediation. And in the first two days, um, the por portion that I teach, one of the questions I ask all of the practitioners is what is the purpose of a peace process? Is the purpose of the process to secure a specific agreement between conflict parties, or is the purpose of a peace process to transform societies? And there isn't a right answer, but the purpose of asking the question and having them debate and discuss the question is to center, first of all, their own positionality and what they think they're doing as a peacemaker, but also to surface the limitations, quite frankly, of the idea of a transformational agenda and of a values-based agenda. And I've been privileged to work in and around 
a lot of really phenomenal peace processes, which I do believe have had profoundly transformational agendas driven by their own people. And I would say Colombia in 2016 is a really good example of that. I would argue, although it, it didn't lead to that transformation, that the Comprehensive Peace Agreement for Sudan had elements of that. The Kenya process certainly did as well. But to get to any of those kinds of transformational issues, you have to transact and you have to find agreements that make sense for those in specific situations of power. So I don't think it's necessarily one or the other, and I would like us to just interrogate a little bit more what all of us are here for, and if we ask that question to each other more honestly, we may have different kinds of discussions about what kind of peacemakers we are. Because just my last point um, on your question about the rise of military solutions and the rise of militarization, which I think is a concern not only for actors we see who are against peace, certainly, who are utilizing military solutions, but the militarized response, militarized response in a lot of our countries, mine included, a lot of talk about winning wars rather than ending wars, that what we need in response to that is an equally robust or even more robust peace response. One of the reasons that everything that has happened since the 7th of October happened last year is not because peace was never possible in, those, in Israel and Palestine. It's because we didn't try hard enough, because we didn't secure peace. We, we didn't do that. We need to double down on those efforts. If we're going to have these securitized responses, our peace response needs to be equally robust. So maybe I'll stop there because I know there's a lot more to discuss. Thank you, Mary I, I'm and, and I just picked up on what you said. Maybe, maybe that can be a motor transact before you transform. And that's a nice modality for us to work together, right? Rather than, as you said, excluding transformative versus transactional. So it's a nice leeway into our uh, conversation with Dr. Hassan. But before that, I think it's very important what you mentioned about our premise coming in and saying this is our value system, we build our states like this and this is how we brought peace to our country, so this is what you should do, but rather how, what the value systems are out there. Um, Dr. Hassan, I would love to, thank you Meredith, um, I would love to hear your thoughts on how Qatar, particularly Qatar, I'm not going to say any more other actors, <laughs> we're talking about Qatari mediation, when it comes to, uh, I mean, number of contexts, you have had experience from Afghanistan to, to Sudan and, and, and to Chad, uh, um, how do you do what you do? What kind of mediation are you doing? What are these approaches? And, and what do you make of this, what we say, transactional uh, mediation? I want to say a quick word on this whole idea, uh, actually, for those of you who are sort of peace watchers, um, or, or peace professionals, whatever you want to call it, we have come to the, again, I shouldn't say this, Meredith, but and I can, I can probably say that it's the end of big peacemaking, co comprehensive agreements and all of this stuff. So we're back to, we see from uh, actors like Qatar and Saudi Arabia and Turkey uh, mediating partial agreements on specific issues, as we said, right? So I would like you to shed light on this one as well. It's, Yes, please go ahead. Um, I did not talk about timing, so you have, you have as, mer as much as Meredith had, 7 to 10 minutes. <laughs> Thank you so much, Max. Anne. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, two, two years ago, uh, you started working with the Center for uh, Conflict and uh, Humanitarian Studies. And one of the early projects that we have taken is to work on documentation and archiving of the Qatari mediation. And I was astonished to know that the Qatari have started their mediation work since 1995. So they have been involved in, uh, in mediation since mid-90s. So we're speaking about almost 30 years now. And later, it has been enshrined in the country constitution. So it is a priority for the country. And recently, with the appointment of foreign minister to be the prime minister, so he is the prime minister and the foreign minister, it shows that the international relation and international engagement is a priority for the state of Qatar. Um, and the issue of emerging a new, it, it might be in literature somehow that it might be offensive for you know, the Gulf state that they are treated, that they are emerging or new. Yeah, but in reality, you will not find it. You know, uh, people who might be accepted. Uh, yesterday we have seen with Dr. Saleh that Saudi Arabia has been doing uh, mediation work since mid-1970s and uh, they have been involved in a huge one uh, in, to bring about peace in Lebanon after five, 15 years of uh, civil war in early 1990s. 
So uh, they say that we are not uh, emerging and we have been there for a long time. But now the attention is being there because of the priorities for the Western country that they are not willing or they are not uh, having it, you know, the mediation as a priority for them in, uh, in different fields. And we can see in a lot of a crisis that, you know, it is the lack of mediators sometimes that they are delay in achieving peace. We can see cases of which speaking about Middle Eastern area, uh, Middle Eastern country, we can see Libya, that it is in conflict since the revolution. So we're speaking about more than 13 years now. Syria, and we have Yemen, we have Sudan, we have Iraq, and... Uh, Palestine for 100 years now, and you know, so it shows that you know the, the the Western world they are not really interested or they are not willing. They, it's not a priority for Western or traditional mediators to be involved heavily, genuinely, and seriously. And in, uh, in Palestine, since I was born, I have heard about you know Roger's initiative. This is my you know the year that I was born. Later in my childhood, I was remembering the words about, you know, in the news, George Schultz is coming to, uh, he was the foreign minister in the 1980s. And later we've spoken about Madrid, Oslo, 30 years, and the blight of Palestinians continues. So this is why there is a significance for those players now. Especially, you know, uh, in, the, in the recent nine months, in our documentation project, the number of documents and articles written about Qatar is huge compared to what has been written about Qatar before Israel-Palestine uh, war. Uh, so it is the huge attention on Qatar. What approach are, uh, uh, they are following or they are employing? I believe that you know, from experience, from the analysis of the experience, we can see that Qatar has been employing you know, mixed approaches. You know, the context will define what approach you're going to follow. So in some cases, if we can see uh, the transactional, which is going to strike a deal, and it is all what we want, we can see that uh, Qatar has been involved in the Lebanese negotiation and the hosting mediation talks in, uh, in uh, 2008. And it was just for the purpose of achieving a deal between Hezbollah and the Lebanese government uh, in order to uh, have this power sharing deal and you know to host uh, to hold hostility, and it was a successful one. On another, uh, you know, uh, uh, processes, Qatar also has a, you know has been involved in a uh, transformative approach and trying you know, to seek to change uh, uh, and you know, build the trust between the parties. Uh, and it is flexible, has taken a long time, and it was hosting a rebellion group from Darfur with the Sudanese government in 2012 for a long period to stay in Doha. And it was a successful also process. And also you will find that Qatar has uh, employed a blended approach of the two approaches together in different countries. We can see, for example, in, uh, in Gaza and in Afghanistan. In Gaza, while is, uh, Qatar has been involved in, uh, con you know, continuously now, but even before, in striking those deals to achieve ceasefire between Israel and the Palestinians in Gaza. But also, Qatar has been involved heavily in working with the Palestinian society in Gaza over the years in post-conflict construction and also in, if I can say, it is conflict preventive measures, you know, to, uh, to ensure stability there, especially with the no-contact policy with the Palestinians, especially with the sanction against Hamas, so the Palestinians were left to nothing but the support coming from the Qataris. So, you know, this monthly uh, aid distribution of $100 to poor families there, it was a major, you know, to uh, conflict uh, management there. You know, the ambassador of Qatar, when he was arriving to Gaza, it was like, you know, the, the one who's coming with the money and with the project and, uh, you know, with all this initiative. And they were successful in, you know, keeping you know, the strip without that, you know, this a huge magnitude of conflict for the years. Uh, 
what else you want to know about Qatar abroad? <laughs> <laughs> I think yes. Um, I, I, you just made me realize again that uh, there is plenty to, you know, that I would love to ask, obviously, and, and it confirms what Meredith said in the beginning. We need to have the humility, actually, to question our approach, but then also inquire into our approaches, into other approaches, forgive me. So here, uh, and it made me realize when you said about mixed approaches in a wide range of contexts, uh, uh, so Meredith, in, like I'm going to move on this transact and then transform. I'm going to move in transact and transform, right? So that's what I will take from you. So it's interesting. It, it actually, uh, we're not going to find answers today, but it's great to pose the right questions. And I personally, as a mediation expert, feel like I want to know more. We need to probe more because we haven't been learning. Partially because if I can say this, forgive my bluntness, there has been a lot of self-referential arrogance on our side that the way we're doing it is the school of mediation. So thank you for that. Uh, Dr. Hassan will come back again. So Khulud, uh, I mean, we have been talking, now we, you know, we're talking about traditional actors in mediate, mediation with transformative approach. We have uh, other actors uh, who have been doing mediation uh, with mixed approaches. And essentially we're talking about, I don't want to say proliferation, but yeah, m crowded field, multiplicity of actors. And it doesn't always bring uh, advantages and potential with it, but it also brings challenges. Um, without making a value judgment, I would like to know from your experience, how do you see this, you know, the, the, sh you know, the mediation field, the conflict settles or resolution field moving with the multiplicity of actors, uh, particularly in the Sudan case, but beyond, if you have the experience, that would be interesting to know. How does that impact uh, the conflict dynamics, but also the peacemaking, if you will? So the multiplicity of actors, old, new, not so new, uh, uh, with different approaches and, and ongoing crises? I think, I think it's fair to say it's, it's a bit of a mess. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a bit of a free-for-all going on right now, and anybody who's watching Sudan and who watched uh, Ethiopia during the Tigray War will attest to this. Just sort of reflecting on the question you asked Meredith of is liberal peace dead, I would say if it's not, it's dying and or on life support, but I'm not very sad about that. I don't think it was a system that worked for many people. I think it was a system that is very much invested in structural inequalities. I think it's a system that was very much predicated on this idea of a teleology, you know, these poor, terrible, what is it, shithole countries, as uh, Trump said, excuse my French, have to somehow transform to become us, whatever this us is. Mm -hmm. You know, when I think of Sudan and how far we've come and how much as a nation we have fought, you know, three different revolutions, etc. I don't want to be the United States. I mean, I don't want to be a country that doesn't look after its homeless, doesn't look, doesn't look after its veterans, doesn't look after its kids, doesn't have maternal health care. Right? I mean, this is not the kind of teleology that I think so many of us would invest in. And I think liberal peace doesn't ever recognize that. And I think this is, goes beyond arrogance and beyond not having humility. It, it's about inculcating a system that works for one part of the world and not for the rest. And there's this sort of sense of you just have to put up with it, frankly, because whatever it is, you, you didn't win world wars or you didn't come out of the Cold War with any kind of badges or medals. And the world is changing. So even though I regret the fact that, particularly in Sudan, particularly in the Horn of Africa, we have now the prevalence and the primacy of countries that don't exactly want democracy, but are very much invested in our futures, I do like the fact that we're moving away from the liberal peace model because it's never really worked for us in the region. But coming back to your question, what we have right now in Sudan are countries, and similarly in, across the Horn, countries that are deeply invested, sometimes opaquely so, in our resources, in our coastlines, and in our sort of political and economic futures, that are at the center of the mediations, which doesn't make any sense to me. Because obviously, if you have the United Arab Emirates trying to put together some kind of deal to end the war in Sudan, it will obviously set about the kind of conditions that will privilege it and its proxy on the ground. And that is not what would be, frankly, A, transformative. It's entirely transactional. But also, it's not going to end the war. So even from a practical perspective, this is maybe something that can bring about a momentary respite, a momentary break. But very soon, we will see a resurgence of the conflicts, and probably even worse. So there are so many arguments for why this current trend is concerning. But it, 
at the same time, I'm glad we're moving from what didn't work. And as Dr. Ghassan said, you know, there's no better sort of indicator or better demonstration of why the system doesn't work because it's a system that has allowed, for example, places like Gaza to go, you know, um, under repression for decades and has almost normalized that. Um, this is not, I think, the kind of methodology, the kind of um, outlook that will bring us the kind of peace that we would want to see in the Horn of Africa. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Khuloud. Yes, um, a, a lot of, um, I don't want to say provocative, but really courageous, right, uh, to challenge even further the, the dying, uh, what do you want to call, I don't want to, the construct, let's put it that, that way. Uh, I, I am actually very sad that the idea of it is dying. And I do remember um, one of our uh, Kurdish friends, when, uh, Moritz, you're here, um, after, uh, right after the invasion of Ukraine, when he was here among you know, uh, other experts, when we were really lamenting about the end of the world, sorry. And, and we were so, so sad that the Ukraine invasion happened. And he had this amazing face. He was like, well, what are you guys sad about? You had 70 years of a peace project. We have, this is our life. We have had it in the Middle East. And you know, it was kind of OK, yeah, right? So um, yes, the, the, uh, the, the European project was a beautiful one. We had 70 years of peace and security on this continent, but not beyond, as you said, rightfully so, right? So, um, can I just say, you know, Europe had all this, you know, wonderful 70 years of, of relative peace, especially compared to what came before, but in many ways it externalized its conflicts to other parts of yeah, the world. So, absolutely. you know, we have to bear that in mind as well. Absolutely, absolutely. No, I think it's, we need another panel and another workshop on this one, definitely. But, um, right, thank you, Holud. Uh, do we want to throw the baby with the water? Um, are we there yet? Or is there like, you know, as, as we said, a part of the one big element of this crisis of the liberal peacemaking is the decline in multilateralism or, or the paralysis, as we said in the beginning, of our multilateral institutions like the UN, like the OSCE. Um, is there, I mean, I would like you to you know, share your uh, thoughts on this. Uh, is it the time to throw the baby with the water, as I said? Can we save these multilateral institutions? Are they still useful for any of the conflict settlement processes that we are looking at in Europe and beyond? Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, thank you, Anna. Uh, the story you shared about the, the Kurdish uh, colleague telling you that, I think, uh, summarizes what I have to say, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Uh, in my very um, uh, negative state of mind about conflict and conflict uh, transformation or uh, resolution. Uh, the questions you, you ask are very pertinent, obviously, but also very extremely troubling uh, uh, questions. Um, uh, Liberal conflict uh, uh, transformation efforts that uh, address conflict drivers that are norms-based uh, and produce sustainable outcomes, win-win outcomes, hopefully, um, seem to be behind us. Or perhaps I should say we're back to what conflict resolution used to be and the interregnum, optimistic interregnum of conflict transformation seems to be uh, over. Uh, the the inter interregnum that started in the early 90s and probably ended sometime uh, in the 2000-2010 period, the 20-year period, is, seems to be uh, over. Uh, I'm afraid the days of uh, George Mitchell and a uh, Good Friday Agreement for Northern Ireland, uh, Lakhtar Brahimi and Nelson Mandela's South Africa miracle that they uh, produced, uh, Sergio Vieira de Melo's uh, East Timor uh, uh, accomplishment, and even Holbrook's uh, Dayton uh, agreement that earlier we discussed briefly that it's in the process of falling uh, apart as good as it was. And the Oslo um, uh, Accords on, uh, on the two-state solution and Palestine. Uh, 
uh, to me seem to be uh, uh, in my cynical mindset uh, today uh, distant memories. Uh, the pre-1990s, one side takes all, might makes right, uh, military victories, uh, military victory-based conflict resolution seems to be uh, back again, I'm afraid. But m much more ominously, beyond might makes right, victories or solution based on war crimes or supported by uh, war crimes, crimes against humanity, ethnic cleansing, and genocide, even genocide, uh, seem to be the new norm in conflict ending. I hesitate to use the word conflict resolution or conflict transformation, just conflict ending. Witness, I don't have to mention uh, Gaza as we speak today. Witness nagorno karabakh last September between Armenia and uh, Azerbaijan. Witness Syria for the last 13 years. Sudan for the last year. Ukraine, on and on. I can go on and on uh, listing uh, conflicts. Humanity, I hate to say this, but humanity seems to have, seems to have lost its moral compass. We seem to have lost our moral compass. And when outright victory for ending conflict is not possible, then too frequently we see neither peace nor war, frozen conflict uh, uh, situations which are prone to reigniting uh, very uh, quickly and very not so surprisingly. Uh, about multilateral institutions which are supposed to help us address and end and uh, uh, transform uh, conflicts like uh, the UN. Once the go-to go, go uh, conflict mediators have been sidelined. I mean, look at what's going on in Ukraine, other than the, the, the grain uh, agreement, which was a great start, but then nothing followed. UN is deadlocked at the Security Council. and seems to lack the leverage and credibility with conflict, uh, conflicting uh, parties. UN has been marginalized during negotiations and lacking broad peace agreements and political transitions that UN mediators could use before to create uh, conflict transformation again like in South Africa or East Timor. This mediator seems to have lost their raison d'etre. I can go to that extreme, okay? Humanitarian aid has become a panacea for conflict transformation or conflict uh, uh, resolution. Again, Syria, Gaza before October 7th uh, come to mind. And even humanitarian, even we even fall short in humanitarian assistance uh, efforts because one or two conflicts suck out all the resources available for the enormous needs out there uh, to start with, what, with 120 plus million uh, uh, displaced persons, persons around the world. 
As for the OSC in, Euro in the European or transatlantic uh, uh, scene, it's even in worse uh, shape than uh, the UN. It seems completely paralyzed, and not just the conflict resolution uh, component of it, but the entire organization seems to be completely uh, sidelined. Why are we here? Very quickly, uh, the, the reasons are too many uh, to discuss here, very complex, but let me offer just three contributing uh, uh, factors very, uh, very quickly. Um, just like the treaty that concluded World War I, the Treaty of Versailles, uh, humiliated and dragged Germany through the mud and the dirt, and we saw the reaction after that, and that is not justifying uh, what uh, Germany did. But we did the same thing in the 90s and treated Russia as the defeated power, we meaning the West, treated Russia as a defeated power. Again, that, is, that does not justify Rus Russia's uh, uh, behavior, Russia's aggression against Ukraine. But that's one of the contributing factors for uh, what happened. And then the war on terror that the West uh, 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 threw at uh, the world uh, with the um, uh, lack of uh, norms in the way in which that war was uh, conducted, and third, the double standards uh, used during uh, that war and uh, beyond, maybe, one, maybe the three contributing factors to the reason why we lost this this optimistic interregnum of liberal uh, peace building and conflict uh, uh, transformation. So we shouldn't be surprised, and this is my last comment, we shouldn't be surprised uh, when witnessing all of these uh, uh, developments in the world, in international relations and in war and peace uh, making uh, efforts, we shouldn't be surprised when Weaker states have returned to the motto of if you want peace, prepare for war. I hate to end it with this conclusion, but that's, that's become an inevitable conclusion of weaker uh, states at the receiving end of might makes right. Absolutely. Thank you, Harai. I think it's, it is a, a good reality check to... to uh, to look into that direction, uh, how the states are trying to position themselves through war or peace in the changing international order. And what I'm, I'm thinking actually now, uh, what shapes, who shapes what, right? Or, or rather, we have peace and security contexts. Does the security context actually, or security dynamics, uh, shape peace processes or peace work? Uh, so Clearly, what I'm thinking of your um, you know, enumeration of a num the constellation of factors that led to failure of, of our work, I I'm thinking because maybe we failed actually to shape the security processes, and now we're at the mercy of the security processes shaping our work. I, I hope I'm making sense, but that's what I'm thinking. And, and right now we're in a context where the, you know, the whole securitization is happening, as you said, uh, um, and, and we are trying to catch up. So we'll, we were, are we going to have to adapt to the new security order around the world and then actually squeeze in there? Or can we, in this crisis, in these times of chaos and crisis, can we actually impact the shaping of the world order? Uh, maybe I'm being too ambitious, but as peace uh, professionals, right from our angle, can we not be at the mercy of the big guys and the big security processes? Will they give us space to do our work? If they don't give us space, then we do, don't do our work, right? So, mm. And I'm thinking of what you said, Meredith, mm. about doubling down on mm. peace work. 
me, this is what I want to come But to. even beyond that, I think that we shouldn't limit our role as peace practitioners to a specific conflict setting that yeah. we work. One of the things that was really striking to me, I moved back um, from East Africa to Canada about four years ago, was how hard it is to be a peace actor in your own society when your own society is divided. That I had this great luxury of being an outsider where I would say to people, you need to come together and talk about these issues and you need to get over your past and your history and you're this and you're that and you need to cooperate and you need to make peace. It's a lot harder to do in your own spaces. And we as peace leaders need to double down on that in our own very divided societies, but also on the multilateral stage. That the multilateral space right now is sort of a situation of conflict itself, and we can make a change in that. We can be leaders in those spaces. I find a lot of the leaders in it incredibly positional, rather than trying to engage in a way to say, how could we reimagine this and understand this and build something better, bigger and better? but I don't think we should seed the ground. And so to your point of sort of the security and can peace actors shape the security, one of the things I worry about is again, seeding the idea that it's militarized and we're trying to find a route through. How do we shift that narrative back so it's peace and military becomes again on the, on the, on the back foot? And I agree with you absolutely, it's not easy. And we are certainly in this, in this ebb at the moment, but I think we can learn an enormous amount from places where there has been success. And Hulud, I really take your point about um, sort of imposition of um, a type of society you want to be. But I think often we all talk about South Africa as one of the great transformative processes. It was a South African process. That was the South Africa for South Africans. And if you talk to anyone who's involved in that process, they say, we heard all of the people from outside, but we chose what we wanted to listen to and use and change. And so there are spaces and places like that that I think we can go back to and figure out what worked. I'd be really interested to learn more about things like and the work you're doing specifically with Palestinian society and have been doing for that period of time, or specifically on Hezbollah and, and the government of Lebanon, obviously a very complicated situation, but one that laid the groundwork for really important changes in Lebanon. And I think we would do well to think a little bit more about some of those. I would also say when we do look at places where it's hard, but it is being done, I think we can't forget Colombia. I think Colombians are doing it and it is unbelievably fragile and massively complex, but they are doing it, and peace is running the table in a lot of those spaces, and security is connected to that, and I think there's a lot we could learn from that. But there's one other thing that I just wanted to note. There's some really interesting research on understanding polarization better in our societies, and it separates out the idea of ideological polarization from the idea of affective polarization. The idea that you and I don't necessarily believe different things, but I just don't like you so I don't believe that you believe the same thing as me. And you're seeing that in a lot of our societies. And I think when we talk about this fragmentation, we need to get under the skin. And we need to think a little bit about things like, do I not trust you because I don't trust your intentions? So I'm sort of saying, you're a, you're a different peace actor to me. I want to learn from you, and that's interesting. But I'm not sure I trust that it's real because I don't trust your intentions. And so I think there's a lot of trust building that we as peace actors need to do with one another, Absolutely. where we sit down and we say, what is your vision of peacemaking? And what's mine? And let's be honest. And let's have those conversations. When we were together in Cambodia, that was the, the purpose of those discussions, right? How can we be radically honest with one another as peace practitioners to try to get get to that next step. Absolutely, with the right intentions, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, you're, ma you're making me think, Meredith, I mean, part of the reason, among other factors, why we wanted to look at how other actors are doing mediation uh, was exactly uh, the, the idea, the realization that we're not able to deal with some of the conflicts at our door, and I'm talking about Ukraine and Russia, right? If I go beyond what you said, and actually the polarization that the reactions from most of our European societies towards the war was polarization within the societies where there was actually no space to speak about, you know, all, all kinds of issues. So the, one of the many reasons that we wanted to see how the other actors, how global partners are, are doing media Mediation. We are. We were not able to do it on our uh, home front. While, as you said, rightfully so, we were traveling the world and, and pre uh, you know preaching to people. So we haven't been able to practice what we 
have been preaching, and it starts here. And I don't want to be all Buddhist or John Lennon, -y, but it starts from yourself, right? And <laughs> so, um, Dr. Hassan and, and uh, Holud also, I want to finish our round of discussions with one question, which again comes down to the doubling down on the peace work, Meredith, what you said. What kind of peace leadership do we need at a time that is still changing? It's going to get more chaotic, so it's really fluid as we go along. It's not static by any means, so it's difficult to say, but we do need peace leadership. So what kind of peace leadership do we need? Um, and can the other actors, can the global partners be at the helm of it this time around? So I would like to know your thoughts and then uh, the thoughts of our other panelists and we'll open the floor to questions. Yeah, you mean uh, in the question that we're speaking about international uh, peace leadership? Yeah, and we can find the whole of you know the global partner in this. So I believe that uh, the, the the gap between uh, the global partner and the traditional mediators is not as huge as it is overstated in literature. And you know, when we're speaking about the state of Qatar, we see that most of you know uh, those who are involved in mediation work, they have been you know working or they have uh, g uh, gone for education in Western University, and you know have they have learned the conflict resolution in Western institutes, and so they are not inventing something that it is very different, and uh, they have some features. I can elaborate if time allows, but. You know, speaking about what we are expecting of international peace leaders, it is you know we want you know the uh, the to stick to the international uh, law, you know uh, to the beautiful thing that the Western civilization has produced. Speaking about United Nations Charter, speaking about international declaration of human rights, speaking about that all human beings are equal. Uh, and of course, I can't avoid, you know, being in Gaza, <laughs> but <laughs> I will be trying to avoid it. Uh, and the things also about, you know, showing empathy and understanding, you know, commenting on, you know, transformation in South Africa that has taken, you know, years to happen, and now it is one state. Why not, you know, trying this, this transformation agenda in Palestine? You know, you know, we can hear this speaking about most of the time speaking about the two-state solution, and it is proved on the ground. You know, when you go there, there is nothing that can be achieved to be called two-state solution. You know, we're speaking in Palestine, in the historical Palestine, we're speaking about almost now seven-seven. You know, almost speaking about or oh, six-seven, maybe six million Palestinians, six million Jewish in historical Palestine. And the Palestinians are just, you know, squeezed in the very tiny Gaza and in the very tiny enclaves in the West Bank. And then we want, you know, to offer them a state. It, it has never been materialized. So my question, you know, or what we are expecting that the international peace leader will be just, will show uh, understanding, will show, uh, you know, uh, transparency, will show accountability. You know, taken again, we're speaking about the Palestinian case. We are speaking about a case that has been there for almost 105 years. And, uh, you know, we have been speaking about numerous peace initiatives. And it's all about illusion. You know, it has never been uh, materialized. And it was very clear to every, to every uh, specialist working in this field that, you know, it has been created just to delay things you know, to make things change on the ground. And uh, on the very same things, even with the, when we see that rhetoric now, a narrative, people are speaking about 7th of October as if Palestinian Israeli had just started. <laughs> you know, they, they don't realize that there is a huge war crime that has been committed against 850,000 Palestinians in 1948. It's called a crimes against the humanity, a forced displacement of a whole nation. There are six million refugees now, acknowledged by United Nations, and they have organization work for them, and they have 194 resolution from United Nations to get them back to their country. But it has never been materialized. So, you know, even the unjust narrative that, you know, Palestinians will feel when, uh, if they are represented, 
you know, people when they are speaking about 7th of October and about the crime that have taken place on 7th of October, as if it has been created of nothing. Yeah, even Secretary General Guterres has spoken about it and he said that it hasn't been created out of vacuum. It has been based on, you know, long, long, long history. And unfortunately, it is for the first time in history that we see those guys, the war criminals, are being, uh, you know, a questionable somehow. But who has been, you know, uh, uh, accountable for all the crime that have been committed against Palestinians starting from 1948? The, you know, forced displacement of 850,000, the destruction of 550 villages, the whole country, and the hundreds of massacres that have been committed against Palestinians, hundreds of massacres that have been committed against Palestinians. And those guys, even they are braved of the war crime, they are appearing on TV, those who have been involved in the war crime in 1948, they appear on TV now on TikTok, and they are just proud of what they're happening, and they are inciting to kill more. Yeah, we want, you know, the land empty of its indigenous people. We want Palestine without Palestinians. Thank you. Dr. Hassan, thank you. Uh, you make me think of the empathy and selective empathy, and sadly, that is one of the maladies of our system at large, right? So, selective empathy and, and how we fall into that trap. Um, right, I saw you wanted to react uh, to, to Dr. Hassan, and then I would like to go on with our peace leadership question before um, we open up, but please. No, actually, one I wanted to react to Meredith. Please. Uh, and the example of Colombia that uh, she mentioned. Indeed, it is really a phenomenal success, uh, despite all the uh, once in a while uh, uh, stumblings uh, that they've gone uh, uh, through. It is a phenomenal success. And I was just recently uh, reading a book from one of the participants in the conflict resolution uh, effort, William uh, Urey, um, a book he wrote called The Possible, not the just possible. A uh, very interesting way he describes the reasons how Colombia became uh, a success. Uh, and I wanted to um, get away from my uh, negative uh, attitude and mention one bright spot in this tunnel uh, that I described at least, and that is Liberia. How did it avoid going back to the civil war, the very, very ugly, difficult civil war that uh, they were in not long ago. Uh, and it's been, what, over 15 years now that they've avoided falling back into the trap. Is it 10, 15 years? More than that, more than 20 years. And the one factor that I can, I have observed that has made Liberia a success in conflict resolution is the involvement of traditional leaders mm -hmm. at the village, very vi village level, provincial le level, and uh, national level. Both faith-based traditional leaders as well as civil uh, society uh, uh, traditional uh, uh, leaders. They've been phenomenally um, uh, successful in resolving local to much, much broader uh, conflicts, uh, still ongoing uh, in society, but preventing those conflicts turning violent. Okay? <laughs> and, and, and I think they deserve all the credit because they did it themselves, okay? Mm -hmm. Outsiders like the Carter Center where I was involved and I had the opportunity to observe what was going on in Liberia. Um, we just provided very modest means to facilitate their work and did not touch beyond that, just facilitating. Mm -hmm. And they did it themselves. It's amazing how it's possible. What is the lesson we learned from that? stay out of it, out of conflicts, and maybe the locals would solve it more easily than, than when the international community is all over them. Uh, I don't know, I'm oversimplifying it, but that's one way 
<laughs> I see. Looking anyway, at it. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Right. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. It's uh, it brings the whole element of local ownership, local initiative, and the con you know the the will of the parties to deal with their own conflicts before others. And 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 it reminded me of of uh, sort of an insight that one of our colleagues mentioned today. Um, maybe it goes a bit into a different direction, but it's like okay, there are different type of actors, right? Those who are able are not willing to do. Those who are willing are not able to do, and then there's the other category, those who are able and willing but are not asked for by the parties. And then the question is, do we need to go in with driven by this helper syndrome or not? But um, I want to move on to Holud, uh, give you the chance to say your you know, sort of final words on the idea of the peace leadership and what I want to pick up also what uh, Dr. Hassan said, the, the illusion and reality, and, and then the, you know, the new peace leadership. What are we talking about? Can we bridge illusion and reality through new leadership? Holud, your thoughts, and then Meredith, I would ask you to wrap up. I think, you know, based on what I said earlier, the, the, and to paraphrase Gramsci here, you know, the, the old mediation world is dying, the new one is struggling to be born, and now is a time of monsters, and I think we see these monsters very clearly in my neck of the woods. Um, and I think what's important now is to understand that it doesn't have to be the way that it's shaping up to be. We don't have to let these meso powers that want to project an influence and a power far more than they actually have, and really use, I think, uh, my part of the world, the Horn of Africa, etc., as a bit of a playground, as, as a bit of a laboratory to try and figure out what works and what doesn't. You know, we don't have to buy into that. We can simultaneously reject what went wrong before, this very hierarchical, this very um, sort of Western-oriented system that doesn't work for a lot of people, but also not. we don't have to accept what is coming either. And I think what the dynamism of the period that we're living through means that we can look at what works, for example, locally-led initiatives like in Liberia, Liberia, but Liberia, of course, is a very specific case, very small country, different sort of political dynamics. And then look at how much we can bring that into the future. And for me, the biggest thing that we need to be taking, the biggest way we can resist uh, the trend that we're seeing of, frankly, autocratic states taking the lead in mediation is to focus on the people on the ground. Now, liberal peace building did not care about people on the ground. Let's be absolutely clear about that. It did a lot of, you know, sort of, you know, giving some little sort of lip service towards inclusion and ownership. And how many times have we heard these tired phrases? But really, how much money was put into this? How much focus was put into this? The way we, even the way we sort of think of track one, track two, 1.5, 2.5, etc. You know, it is about creating a hierarchy of who should be invited to the table first and foremost. Who gets to dictate what happens next? Rarely is it the track two folks that really talk about um, are really putting the terms of the peace, and they are the ones that want the transformation. So liberal piece is very conservative, it's very structured, and it's not very helpful. And this is why I would push back on, on the South Africa example, because, you know, what did the South African piece rely on? It relied on a lot of magnanimity from the black majority. I mean, it, effectively, you have a deal where accountability was you know, tell us where the bodies are and we'll forgive you. It was a deal where, you know, sort of economic justice was really not engaged with at all. I mean, 10% of the population having 90% of the resources and keeping them in this very unfair Faustian pact in order to, what, bring about change? Yes, transformative, and a lot of people felt that they had gained from it. But speak to South Africans today and look at the way that uh, the ANC performed in the latest elections. You know, these things might work momentarily, but Unless they're truly transformative, there will only be a finite moment in which they function. And what I worry about in countries like Colombia, and I've heard this from Colombians and also Liberians, is that you know this works for now. But unless it's truly transformative, we don't know at which point we might go back into either a conflict or at least some kind of um, change. And you know, similarly, away from these examples, if we look at countries like Sudan, a lot of the peace processes and I. There are seven, I think, peace tracks on Sudan right now, none of which have a chance of succeeding because of the way they've been set up. But all of them rely on the magnanimity of the belligerents. And these are belligerents who have told us time and again when they unseated Bashir in 2018, when they led the coup in 2021, when they started the war in 2023, that they are not interested in a peace that they cannot dictate. And yet we see from the international community this sort of 
you know, taking them at their word, which to us on the ground is nonsensical. Um, and it's, it's frankly a system that doesn't work. It's, you know, accountability for thee, but not for me. And this is at various levels, right? For example, look at the way that the US has conducted itself. As Dr. Hassan has mentioned in other countries, there is no talk of accountability for Iraq. There is no talk of accountability for Afghanistan. And so it's kind of, you know, it doesn't make sense that then these are the people that uphold the system that says we must inculcate accountability in any and all peace processes. It just doesn't make sense. It's not adding up. Right. Um, but just brief briefly, I'll say that um, there is an opportunity to do things better. And I think one thing that liberal peace really robs us of is an imagination that goes beyond the scope of what it prescribes. And I think there is an imagination that is being invested in every day by people in civil society, by people on the ground, by people in all sorts of walks of life, whether it's a diaspora, etc., in any given context. And they are imagining a different future for themselves. They are imagining ways of transforming, ways of organizing, ways of engaging that frankly have no space in the liberal peace model that we've seen now. I mean, if you think of, let's, let's go to Sudan because the context I know well. You have a lot of organizing on the ground. You have neighborhood resistance committees that led a revolution, unseated the 30-year dictatorship of Omar al-Bashir, were completely left out of the transitional period in favor of political elites, and now are being almost entirely left out of the negotiations and, and sort of even the thinking around what comes next. And in favor of, instead of that, we're seeing laser focus from the international community on the political elites that frankly have failed for decades to bring about transformative change. And we have to ask the question also, do they want transformative change? Because they have become so used to functioning in a political system that I don't think they're able to see beyond that. And so if you look at what they bring to the table, you know, it's national dialogues, it's the same tired old mechanisms and very much UN-based um, mechanisms that they can't really think beyond that. But there is a group of people that are, and I think we need to engage with them as much as possible. And frankly, we haven't seen any of it. But I think they need to lead the way. And they are, if we look closely enough. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kholud. Thank you, I mean, you're pointing, you're putting Absolutely. your finger. <laughs> to the most painful point, I find it fascinating, the paradox that you mentioned, right? That liberal peace being so conservative that it actually doesn't touch people's, the people, right? Uh, which is totally counterintuitive, but it's the reality because we are obsessed about state-built, state-centric approach, right? Top down, and, and we get stuck there. And the second point is uh, really the, the habit of doing things the way we have been doing, right? And because it's institutional survival and it's beyond that, absolutely. Uh, Meredith, uh, how can we do this differently, better? Um, right, just also if I could just say, because I think, um, Khalid, your final point is just so important is, um, um, I was with some of the members of the Sudan Youth Network recently, and one of the things that they kept saying was, don't organize for us, organize with us. Mm -hmm. And this invisibility or deliberate invisibilizing because it's messy and you can't figure out who's in charge, right? And one of the things that was coming out several times, them was they said, stop plucking a youth to something, recognize that we ourselves have systems and ways that you don't understand. It doesn't matter that you don't understand. Respect and protect those spaces that we exist in if you want to work with us. And I think those, those, those messages need to come out more and more and more, and we need to be held accountable to them. But I think that's part of what we can do, right? And this comes back to this point, we're not just peace leaders from nine to five. Right, like this is what we say we do, then we need to do it, and we need to really do it in all of these spaces, which is in discussions with our diplomatic services, discussions with the United Nations, discussions with Sudanese youth, discussions at all of those different levels and spaces. I love that you quoted Gramsci. I just recently gave a TED talk and I opened it with that specific quote and followed it with a quote from Maria Reza at the Paris Peace Forum last year when she said, we're standing in the rubble of the world that was and we need to create the world we want to live in. And that's really stayed with me as well, is that we have to do this, and we can lament and we can wring our hands and we can be worried about it, but then we need to act. And there's a couple of things just th that have been kind of rolling around in my head from this conversation, and one is this idea of transformation. It's a really big word. 
And sometimes I'm actually not even sure I know what it means. Because, you know, to your points on South Africa, yeah, it hasn't transformed, but what is transformed? Like, is it an end state? Because it's still in a process. And how will we know? When do we decide that it's succeeded or failed? How long does that process need to take? These are multi-generational processes. Often when people say mediation shouldn't be transformative, it's because we're not there long enough. These are, these are multi-generational processes. So I think we maybe need to dig down a little bit about what we actually are claiming to want with transformation or expect with transformation, that maybe it's putting down kind of a paving stone towards something. And um, we've been in touch quite a lot with a really um, profoundly impressive Israeli-Palestinian peace movement, A Land for All, who really try to imagine a space for belonging for all Israelis and Palestinians, which I've been really inspired by. And one of the things that they talk about is recognizing how far in the future their vision is, is so far that it's almost hard for people to imagine. But what they're trying to do is figure out how to get people to take a step now that doesn't get you further away from that vision at a minimum and hopefully gets you a little bit on that path. And so I think we can be better at doing some of those pieces. But the last thing I wonder about with this idea of liberal peace and transformative peacemaking and that sort of thing is coming back to this question of intention. And could we all also have more honest conversations about what it means to be a principled peace actor and what are the first principles that we would want to go back to? What are some of these questions about it, impartiality? Is that even, I mean, is that even achievable? Like we claim that, you know, the United States is an impartial peace actor when they were working on the CP in Sudan. I mean, come on, right? Of course they're not. So maybe we sort of do away with some of those platitudes and we think a little bit more about what the real intentions are. But I think the thing that we can do is have those honest conversations and figure out where to do it in every setting that we're in so that we can start to change this and create the world that we want to live in. So Thank, you, Meredith. Thank you very much. I mean, it's uh, honesty. Is, is, uh, I think that's what we have started doing, right, in this conversation. What do the Americans call radical honesty? Radical honesty, absolutely. Um, I want to open the floor uh, for the next. Uh, we started um, 10 minutes late, so we can use our next 15 minutes um, for questions. I'm sure you have uh, questions to our amazing panelists. I see uh, Vigwe, I see Irene. Okay, uh, right, uh, Fabiola and Shura, did you have a hand up as well? Okay, so, so for, let's take this. Uh, Ovigwe, please go. Mike, thank you. Thank you. So, uh, first, of, I have a question, but I have to preface the question. I, th I think, from my perspective, the the topic, right? We're focusing on actors. I think we need to focus on the the intellectual and and uh, theoretical frameworks that these actors are actually bringing to the table, not necessarily who these actors you know, are, because that's very important, and uh, I'll talk about that later. Then on liberal peace model, um, I'm someone who very, very much respects the structural realist uh, view of the world, but I must say, despite its fault, uh, liberal peace model has had successes, right? Uh, you mentioned li li Liberia. I'm very quite familiar with Liberian context. The Liberia was uh, uh, messy, but is able to be together today because of the liberal model, actually. Because the liberal model actually believes in the individual to be good, right? And that is why the DDR, DDR, the, the radicalization, and sorry, demobilization and uh, reintegration and all of that. Why Liberia was different? On Mill came up with the, the, the DRR, uh, DRR and, and they were able to do that. But the, the local solution you mentioned also very, very important. So it was not necessarily the typical liberal approach, but also combined with the local. And let me tell you why the local was very, very successful. The local ended up not only creating the context for the, for the peace building to really go on, but they became the early, early warning uh, commanders on the ground. Because before there's any break in conflict uh, or this relapse, these traditional leaders would be the first to, to call on to say, look, 
something might end up happening. So because they were involved, they ended up being you know, very much uh, part, of, part of preventing a, a relapse. So I think the traditional model you mentioned is very, very crucial, particularly in the African context. We saw it also in Rwanda with Gachacha. They just said, okay, we're not going to use only the liberal model, we're going to, we're going to also go to our traditional uh, methods as well. So the question, I think, like I said, is we now have to look at uh, both local and so-called emerging actors, what the intellectual basis, the intellectual basis from the research in like, uh, Rwanda or in Liberia is that the, the, this, the good of the collective is higher than the, than the individual. Right, so uh, it's it's quite different from a, a very individualistic liberal uh, view uh, or, of, of of the world. Uh, now, liberal peace model works. It depends on the context, and sometimes you might need liberal peace model to actually start the process, and then you can go on uh, to the next. So, not to take all of the time, I think we need to really you know dive deep into this and look at other. Uh, approaches to, to peace, like maybe developmental peace that China actually brings to Africa. Yeah. Irene, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Irene uh, Keen uh, from the board of the ACP here. Um, thank you very much for this, uh, for this very interesting panel. I, I would like to bring basically um, the thinking back to the overall theme of uh, this peace forum, which is a climate for peace. You know, in one of the panels uh, uh, earlier uh, during our, our meeting, uh, a panelist uh, uh, asked very vividly for um, a, a renewed attempt to demilitarize because we are in a context of militarization and, and it, it appears that military force is the only way of, of moving forward where, where, wherever that forward movement gets us, right? So how, what can we do as a, as a community of, of, of persons who are uh, committed, I would think, to peace and to peacemaking under whatever paradigm we consider most uh, successful in the current circumstance? Uh, what can we do to actually uh, create uh, a, a climate for peace again or contribute to creating a climate for peace again in our societies, with with our governments, uh, in 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 the decision making levels at various uh, at various levels. Thank you. Thank you, Irene. We had Fabiola and Angela. Thank you. Thank you all. I've been really enjoyed this conversation. I have two questions, if that's okay. The first is really not my question. It's a question that uh, Robert Meister asks in his book. After Evil, I'm not sure if people have read, maybe it's not been picked up, it it's, um, was published in 2011. But his question is a simple one, who benefits from a human rights discourse? And I see this question of liber liberal peace um, very much about this idea of human rights discourse. Um, in, in, it's a gigantic book, it's over 500 pages, but if, if it, part of his critique is that uh, what a human rights discourse does is change what our, I think, does a, a thing about evil and past, um, distinguishes from past evil and uh, what, who the beneficiaries of that past evil has had or past violence. Um, so bringing in um, the, the, what human rights discourse actually does is just absolve the responsibility of what that past evil is and continues to keep the status quo of um, the, the beneficiary. People can apologize about the past, say, okay, we, we've, uh, we've made mistakes, but keep the status quo and continue to benefit from that past evil. Um, so I'd love to hear each of you reflect on what, who has benefited so far from a human rights discourse or from li liberal peace. Um, and the follow-up to that is in thinking about transitional justice or transformative justice, uh, whether those keep, the, uh, keep us in this limbo period between time of like past, past injustice to, just, to what justice might be, 
And what is your vision of that justice when we say no justice, no peace? What is that justice if, if there is one? Thank, Thank you, you, Fabiola. Um, for the sake of time, I, I mean, I'm hoping we're taking note of the questions. It's a great, great question, but if you allow me, I take two more questions and we open up. So I have Angela and I have, Stefan, you had a question? Okay. I don't have a question, but I still would like to get some comments on it. And I want to get back to the mediation. And I found it very interesting what was said about it. And also, you mentioned some of the examples of mediators and people who had concluded uh, agreements. And I must tell you that one of the things that ha I have not heard is that the personality of the mediator is extremely important. It is something that I find absolutely crucial. And let me tell you, I've been involved in a number of negotiations. And it is not something you can learn by the book. You have, for example, in the United Nations, you have a mediation unit. And these are all very good people. But they are not the people who are going to negotiate a, you know, a, a peace agreement or anything. But they're rather someone who is like helping with what could the process be, where are the ideas, etc. And you learn peacemaking and you learn mediation by learning from someone and watching it in action. That's been my experience and I think it's very important. And the most important thing is I think the integrity in that you can create trust between others, that you can create trust between two parties that are not in sync with each other and that are actually fighting each other. And the other aspect I wanted to mention uh, is something that we always forget. It takes time. And it comes to me, Meredith, because you mentioned uh, Colombia. I was involved in the early 2000s in the Colombia effort. That's when it really started. That's when we started talking to the government. That's when we talking about the guerrillas. I mean, it was both sides, ELN also. But it took a long time before people thought through this process. And we always had a discussion about in the UN whether it's possible to, quote, ripen a a, a conflict, which I think is a very controversial idea. But on the other hand, there were some of us, I'm, I'm not necessarily including myself in it, but there were some of the people in the UN who said, yes, 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 we must ripen. I think it's very dangerous to do that. But we must give peace processes or possibilities to come to a peace and agreement time. And very often it fails the first time, there's a pushback, you know, you don't go back, and then years and years pass and the situation gets worse on the ground. So thank you. Thank you, Angela. Uh, we have Stephanie and then we um Go to our panelists. I'll be very brief. Thank you so much. I think it was super interesting. And I think you also touched upon, upon the different natures of conflicts and wars. Obviously, it makes a huge difference if it's an interstate war or, or, is, or if it is a civil war. So, I mean, obviously, you need then to adapt the approach. However, um, if I would maybe maybe touch, maybe also in line what um, Angela said, I mean, the problem is very often also political leadership and the lack of political will, which needs to be created. And the question is, who could actually be that? I mean, we, we heard, I mean, one way of doing it is by military means, which has been happening recently. I mean, um, Nagorno-Karabakh was mentioned. And obviously, um, uh, the other thing is what I would like to mention and I would like to reflect you upon is, is, the, is prevention. Um, because those conflicts normally are there for a longer time. I mean, Israel-Palestine is there, I mean, you said it, since the creation, and obviously afterwards, I mean, it's not that it started on 7th of October, but nobody actually invested in the last 20 years, there was no peace process going on, on a political leadership, there happens initiatives on the ground, we all know about it, they're super important, but actually to get out of this crisis, you need to create political will, and you need to see who is able to coerce this, and these people are lacking, and what do you think about, um, about this, so prevention, and maybe, just additionally, there is an asymmetry of actors all the time. I mean, we know it, especially in Israel and Palestine. Palestinians do not have at all any asymmetry when it comes to engaging in this process, and you find it everywhere else. Armenia, Azerbaijan, it was um, Armenia was stronger then, and then Azerbaijan got stronger. And so if you don't come to political solutions for conflicts on the ground, the risk that it escalates by a military means are a lot higher in general. So I don't think if it's only that, you know, military action is back. It's, it's actually obvious that it's going to be back if we don't come to political conclusions and political solutions of these issues where we need political leadership and prevention. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. I think um, we have um, a nice palette of questions. Um, I would ask you right to start uh, one, two minutes, whatever you can uh, react to, um, share your thoughts, that would be great. Uh, I think what you said about the personality of the mediators uh, mattering. It is so true, so true. Um, that's why when I was uh, presenting my case, I, I didn't just mention the conflict or the, uh, the, the end result, but also the mediators, George Mitchell, 
Lachtar Brahimi, uh, uh, Mandela, um, uh, etc. It is it is absolutely true, and uh, I can't add any more than what you uh, said. But I wanted to uh, talk about the contrast of conflict resolution between what was done in Colombia and what was done in Bosnia. Um, uh, in Colombia, all the actors in the conflict were involved in the conflict resolution. Okay, uh, and even then, we had, we we still have uh, problems. But at least it's moving; it's a moving process. But in Bosnia, the actors were not involved in the conflict resolution effort, or some of the actors were not involved in the conflict resolution. The external leaders of those actors, uh, some of them were involved, but. The actors continued the war in other, by other means because there were 60,000 NATO troops there uh, to protect what was agreed in uh, Dayton. Um, and those actors continued the war by other means. And even today, they're continuing to destroy the agreement that put an end to, to the war. Even to this day, 30 days next, next year since Dayton, and they're continuing the, uh, the thing. The, the, the point being, the, if the actors are not involved in designing and, and implementing uh, uh, the, uh, the peace agreement, uh, an obvious point, obviously, but so often we forget that. Right. Yeah. right. Yeah, I mean, if, if I was to be facetious, I would say to the comment about um, liberal peace having successes, I'd say, you know, even, even a broken clock is right twice a day, right? So you are going to get invariably some successes, but in specific relation to Rwanda, what's going to happen when Paul Kagame dies, right? If it's that transformative of a deal, what, why is what's happening in Kivu right now happening in Kivu? And what happens when this man dies, right? If these are the questions that you can't answer, then it's an ephemeral success. And really, it may actually end up being the putting in place the foundations for an even greater atrocity later down the line. So I'm just saying that the way we measure success also needs to take into account how long these successes can be around for. But I wanted to come to your question about e past evils and transitional justice, because I think it's so important because transitional justice is not something that has a universal definition. And the way that people on the ground perceive what transitional justice looks like is very, very different to oftentimes what the mediators conceive of transitional justice. And so you have people who think, you know, the ICC, for example, is the only place where transitional justice can take place. Um, but there are so many issues with that, which we won't go into. But there are actually more transformational justice mechanisms. You know, I'm not sure to what extent people in Sudan, for example, will feel that justice was done if, after all this time, Omar al-Bashir is taken to the, to the ICC and then lives the rest of his life in a very comfortable prison in The Hague. Whereas there might be more local and customary ideas about what constitutes transitional justice, and that could be, for example, about recompense, whether it's political or economic recompense, or about living together in some kind of pact of coexistence, or it could be about truth and reconciliation commissions, hopefully not like the one in South Africa. Hopefully it could, or it could be something about a hybrid court system that is more formalized, or it could be traditional leadership that makes some kind of pact. And all of these need to be looked at, but rarely any of them are. And it's all very much about the formal and the sort of more, much more official transitional justice processes at the expense of what might actually work out more. In, in on the ground for communities that gives them a sense that actually justice has been served and that some healing can begin. Because unless that healing begins, there will absolutely be the return to fighting because a sense of grievance that underpins that violence would not have gone away. But absolutely take your point and the point about the book that you mentioned, that past crimes, you know, let's take slavery, let's take colonialism, I mean, there's been absolutely no um, justice on that front at all for anyone. And, you know, just sort of the usual um, very hard-won apologies from, you know, act, um, leaders in 2020 um, is, is quite ridiculous, really, that we don't think of that. But I, again, this is how the liberal peace model reproduces itself, right? 
think of the now, we are the, you know, the example, we are the exemplar of how things should be, just don't look at our history as recent as it is, and then we will tell you how to live. And I think that is why we're seeing so much frustration with it, and so much pu pushback from many people around the world. Thank you, Holmes. Anna, with, my, with apologies, just two fingers. I forgot to mention the reason why I picked up on the personality of the, the, the mediator. If no matter what the personality of the mediator is, if that mediator does not have an agency, does not have, uh, is not empowered to do the job uh, he or she uh, is out there uh, to do, they will fail. And a, a prime example is Lakhtar Brahimi and the miracle that he was uh, able to produce with the local partners in South Africa. The same Lakhtar Brahimi became a mediator in, uh, in Syria. Uh, 10 years now, 10 years ago now, I guess. Yeah, He failed, utterly failed and left frustrated because he was not empowered. He was not allowed to do what he was, he was appointed uh, uh, to do, okay? The, the West wanted Lakhtar Brahimi to become uh, their agent in the mediator's position, but Lakhtar Brahimi refused to do that. And I, thought, I don't think this is a secret. It's an obvious uh, uh, thing, right? And he failed because he did not, he was not empowered. He did not have the agency to do what he was best able to do. Thank you, Raj. I, I think that's a different session, Angra, all together with, you know, together with so many other factors that have an impact on the success or the, or the outcome of a process. Um, Dr. Hassan? Yeah, I have three comments. On, uh, one for on the climate for peace that I can see with what, uh, considering what we are witnessing nowadays, it is uh, very difficult to foresee that we have a, f uh, a peaceful future or in, in the near future. Uh, however, uh, we should, you know, keep trying always and inspired, you know, to achieve all these peaceful values, and try, you know, to, uh, you know, that what thing that we can do that we can, that, you know, traditional mediators with the global uh, partners to work together to try to bring about peace through, you know, shared responsibility, introducing holistic approaches and. Uh, uh, amplifying, you know, the resources and the strengths of every partner, and uh, commenting on the feature of leadership and the importance of the leader uh, involvement in uh, in a negotiation or mediation process. I can relate to the Qatari experience in shedding some light on it. Also, that you know uh, the Qatari involvement in uh, you know, speaking about. The Emir, Emir of Qatar, this is like the president of the country, is usually involved at this highest level, and you know it is the leverage that we can see that you know decision making uh, chain is very very short in Qatar, which makes result faster, and also the usage of the Emir network sometimes it is helping you know to negotiate and convince parties for example to come or to accept or to concede or whatsoever so it is part of if we want you know to see in the Qatari experience yes it is very important this is the highest level involvement in in, uh, in the negotiation or in the mediation and the other things about the transition of justice and you know human rights, it's all beautiful things, but unfortunately it is very, very, very selective. Um, you know, I'm occupied to speak about Palestine, but it's not only Palestine, it is, it is everywhere. Yeah, it is very selective. Thank, Thank you, you. Dr. Hassan. Meredith, your final words. Um, Starting with uh, sort of Rob Meister's book and After Evil, you know, I um, I live in and come from a post-genocidal society where we have absolutely benefited from exactly what you've described at the expense of the indigenous peoples of the land, right? Like, we um, have a publication that, um, that was opened by a poem um, from a, a very senior elder on whose land we sit, and it begins, this place came to be at the expense of my people. And, and that's something that we can't ever forget, and we have to figure out kind of how we do, how we repair that over and over and over again every day 
for generations and generations. And I think often apologies become the thing, or land acknowledgments in Canada or what have you, and people don't do all of those other pieces, which takes me back to this question of transformation. How do you do that over time, right? But to your question of what, who benefits from liberal peace, I think there's a couple things in here, and one of those is that there are interests, right? That there are interests in, I want to help make peace in your society so that I have influence there. Maybe it's economic influence, maybe it's military, maybe it's a port, maybe it is whatever it is. But there's absolute interests within that. So again, in terms of sort of not wanting to romanticize liberal peace, we need to sort of look really, really squarely at where those benefits are, and then and think again to questions of intention and um, and uh, and interests around emerging approaches to um, to to mediation. I think um, Angela, your point on personality of the mediators. I I also think that we have to as we build new generations. Because I was think I was listening to your list, um, and I was I would have added Anand to that list, and I would have thought, gosh, that's a list of old men. <laughs> <laughs> and with love and respect True. to all of them, that's a list True. of old men. True. And so we also need to think about what are the personality traits that we want to encourage and inculcate in peace leaders as they go forward. And I think some of them have been discussed here today. Humility, conviction, empathy that you raised, I think, are so, are so critically important as we, as we sort of go forward. Um, and then on this question of political will, I think it's one of the real one of the biggest challenges that we face right now is that people don't believe that peace can be made. And when I think back to, um, to Kenya and um, to the uh, post-election violence and the mediation in 2008, um, and I mean, it's a very specific case. It was phenomenally specific, but we, everybody believed. Everybody believed in Kenya. Everybody believed in Anan. Everybody believed in the parties. The parties had their people behind them in various, in various ways, and people believed in peace then. When I talk to people now about, even with colleagues from A Land for All about Israel and, and Palestine, when I talk to people about Sudan, people don't believe. They don't believe that it's possible, and the military approaches feel like, well, we can do this. We can do this. This makes me feel better because I feel like I'm acting. We don't believe, and we need to bring that back if we're going to shift the balance. And I think that this balance of power in so many of these places is also really paralyzing several of us. I feel this very strongly on Myanmar when you look at, again, an absolutely frozen solid wall of no interest in any kind of process or dialogue. How do we shift that? We have to get people to believe in peace, and then we have to get them to double down with some courageous actions that are beyond just platitudinal statements of you know, solidarity for people in these places. We have to, you know, when I saw what happened in, in Kenya, people were spending political capital, they were spending interest-based capital to try and support that process. And so those of us as external actors, if we want to do it, we have to really put our money where our mouths are in that sense. Thank you so much. Um, with that, I mean, I will just add one word to the beautiful world cloud that we put together here with the honesty, empathy, uh, and, and beyond. I would like to add the commitment, and that's commitment to peace and peace work at a time when the space shrinks, the, the need becomes higher and higher, and that's one of the paradoxes. And probably the discomfort for all of us to live with the fact that peace is never a product, it's a process, it's an ongoing process, and live with that fluidity. And what we can do, Irene, I'll finish with that probably dream big, but be happy, work hard towards that dream, but be happy with very little incremental steps and rewards and successes, because that's the, another paradox of our field. So with that, um, I'm, uh, please join me in thanking our amazing panelists for the great discussion. And thank you to you. And thank you. Thank you. Damita, we started 15 minutes late and we finished 15 minutes late, so my Swiss image is saved. <laughs> That's fair enough. Thank you so much, Anna. Thank you so much to all our speakers. A few organizational announcements for me uh, once again. This concludes now the official part of the day. We invite you now to join us for dinner at the hotel, which will be served starting 15 minutes ago. But don't worry, you have time until 8. 
After this, we've planned a traditional Austrian classical concert for you here in this hall at eight. It's, um, you know the young musicians playing if you've attended the opening. They are four young people called the Young Pannonian Spirit Quartet. They were founded right here in 2015 in Burgenland as an intercultural orchestra. They see themselves as a musical peace project. And as those of you who were present at the opening will know, they do a wonderful job and they play some amazing music. So um, I hope you have time to attend. For tomorrow, if you're staying outside of Stadtschleining, tonight we do again have buses picking you up at eight and at 10 and the hotel's wine cellar is also happy to welcome you. If you're staying in such lining tomorrow morning, please remember to check out of your hotel before coming here. Luggage can be left at the hotel, but you will not have time to check out before your transfer leaves to Vienna. So um, those of you staying in Bad Hatzmannsdorf and Oberwart who are taking our transfer back to Vienna, and I think this is probably the most important announcement, bring your luggage with you here tomorrow morning. There will be no buses after the conference ends back to Bad Tatzmannsdorf and back to Oberwart. So tomorrow morning, you'll be able to bring your luggage, leave it in the hotel at Schleining. But if you do not bring your luggage on the morning transfer, then you will not have a way to retrieve it. Your morning transfers will be leaving just like today at 8.15 from Oberwart and at 8.30 from Bad Tatzmannsdorf. We meet right back here tomorrow. We start on time at 9 a.m. sharp into the evening.